This is Y490 Politics of the Internet, February 8th, 2012. This lecture deals with the relationship between information and communications technologies and democracy. The code word for this is e-democracy. So in this lecture I want to address a bunch of questions including what is democracy in general, a little bit, a short introduction to democratic theory, uh, how does e-democracy differ from uh, democracy in general? What are some of the earlier efforts before the Internet uh, to use technology to enhance democratic participation? And I'll be talking about interactive cable TV, public access TV, and the well. Uh, democracy uh, in democratic theory, there's quite a strong distinction made between direct democracy versus representative democracy. In direct democracy, each citizen gets a vote and the votes are tallied to decide uh, what public decisions will be made. That's sort of the model of Athenian democracy uh, of, of city-states, democratic city-states in Greece, classical Greece. Uh, in representative democracy, which is much more typical of the modern era, you have citizens electing their representatives and then the representatives voting on various types of legislation. In all democratic theory, there's quite a lot of consideration of the role of elections and election campaigns, the role of parties, how parties interact with social movements, uh, what's the role of money and, uh, and economic power in electoral systems, uh, what causes rises and declines in the participation of voters or the apathy of voters. Uh, three important figures in democratic theory are Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Thomas Paine, and Alexei de Tocqueville. Rousseau uh, was the first to talk about the popular will uh, and was considered to be one of the fathers of the French Revolution. Thomas Paine was a key pamphleteer at the time of the American Revolution and who wrote very much about uh, popular sovereignty, pretty much in the same tradition as Rousseau. Alexis de Tocqueville, writing in the 19th century after observing life in, in uh, the United States, began to talk about uh, the, the importance of civil society and the development of civil society, uh, groups, uh, churches, and other types of civil, civic, civil society organizations as part of the growth of democracy. He's also very strong on the importance of tolerance and uh, the acceptance of other people's views. These are some of the key issues in the literature on representative democracy. First of all, there's the issue of corruption or vote buying um, in, in early uh, English democracy. You have the, the uh, rise of the so-called rotten borough, uh, where uh, a small group of people basically pay off the voters in order to win a series of elections. Uh, you also have the issue of the tyranny of, of the majority where uh, some minority is hurt uh, because there's a, a stable majority that votes against their interests. Um, then you have the question of how do you hold your elected representatives accountable after between elections. Um, there's the issue of the balance uh, or division of power among elect executives, legislatures, and judiciaries. Uh, you have the question of political factions, factionalism, uh, par oh, partisanship, particularly extreme partisanship, and the rise of special interests. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, changes over time in the level of voter apathy and popular participation. Um, three more contemporary thinkers are considered to be important contributors to democratic theory. Jürgen Habermas uh, writing about the ideals behind uh, the idea of dem democratic uh, politics. Uh, he has a theory of communicative action which allows for people to have genuine discussions in public about important issues that divide them. Um, Benjamin Barber advocates a stronger form of democracy than we have in most representative democracies. And James Fisk Fishkin has been talking about uh, the importance of deliberation and the need to create special forums 
to produce more deliberative outcomes in democracy. Uh, Robert Putnam's uh, recent book, Bowling Alone, has made a big impact on thinking about democracy. Uh, Putnam is a professor of political science at Harvard. Uh, his basic thesis in the book is there's not as much participation in traditional civic associations by U.S. citizens as in the past, for example, uh, as in the early 19th century when Alexei de Tocqueville was uh, uh, viewing the American daily life. And this is pro a problem because uh, participation uh, of that sort tends to increase levels of trust among the citizens, uh, which he calls social capital. And uh, without that trust, uh, people become uh, less likely to participate in politics. Uh, he thinks there may be two reasons for that, uh, that uh, the rise of television, uh, with the rise of television, people stay at home instead of going out and socializing with other people, um, that uh, there are other forms of civic participation uh, that have arisen, which uh, um, as compared to older forms of civic participation, uh, permit less contact between citizens with differing views. Uh, one attempt to think about how technology might make democracy stronger uh, was a cable TV system called Cube that was introduced in 1977 in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, this uh, system allowed for much greater interactivity between the viewer at home and the, uh, the channel, the cable channel that offered the service. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, system was uh, financially unsuccessful and the experiment ended in 1994. Um, we have uh, an experiment of using cable access television as a kind of forum for improving democratic participation. Uh, we have uh, our own cable access television channel in Bloomington called CATS. Uh, there, as in many other cable access channels, you get gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of school board meetings, city and council, city and county council meetings, and county commission meetings, and occasionally even gavel-to-gavel -gavel of the state legislature, although the Indiana legislature is not very open uh, compared to other states. Uh, also on these channels you can get citizen created content uh, not mediated through uh, news organizations controlled by the broadcasters and also some additional forms of local news. Uh, Hacker and Van Dyke define digital democracy as a collection of attempts to practice democracy without the limits of time, space, and other physical conditions using information and communications technology or computer mediated communications instead as an addition not a replacement for traditional political practices. Uh, the uh, well, uh, the whole earth electronic, I forget what the L stands for, uh, was created by um, um, Stuart Brand, the founder of the whole earth catalog, uh, as a kind of early bulletin board system uh, and uh, the, the surprise there was uh, how much the people who participated in this forum, uh, how many things, how often they discussed things with each other, and how intense their interactions were. Um, you can read about the, the well in Howard Rheingold's book, The Virtual Community, and uh, there's Fred Turner's book, From Counterculture to Cyberculture. Um, the well still exists, but uh, it's an interesting example of early uh, attempts to build online uh, democratic discussion and participation forms. Um, one of the big concerns of people who worry about uh, voter apathy and lack of participation is, are the constraints on citizen participation that exist uh, in most modern democracies. Uh, because people work long and irregular hours, sometimes it's very difficult for them to get off from work to, to vote or to do other kinds of political actions. Uh, people spend increasing amounts of time on consumption, shopping, recreation and entertainment. Uh, Putnam, as I said before, is concerned about the lack of investment in social capital. Uh, 
lack of participation outside of the, the electoral arena in other kinds of social uh, social activities. Um, some people fear reprisals or sanctions uh, from their employers or other people uh, for participating. Uh, many people lack confidence in their knowledge and skills uh, and therefore take themselves out of, out of um, the democratic arena. And then there are simple environmental constraints, uh, lack of public transportation, shortage of meeting spaces, uh, sometimes legal restrictions on uh, where you're allowed to meet with other people. In the 1990s, the Pew Charitable Trust undertook uh, funding of the Pew Internet and American Life Project, uh, which became part of the Pew Research Center in 2004. Uh, the tasks of this project were to monitor online activities and examine how online activities affect families, communities, health care, education, civic, and political life. Uh, their research is very important in, in uh, sort of tracking trends in this area. Uh, another set of, uh, another research project that has done something of this sort is Bruce Bimber's research on presidential elections. Uh, two main books with uh, Richard Davis, he published Campaigning Online and then uh, roughly the same time Information and American Democracy. Uh, looked at uh, presidential elections in 2000 and 2004. Um, uh, the main finding was that the internet was used by candidates and political parties and not by the public too much. Uh, the public still got most of its information from newspapers and television, but uh, there was rapid growth from a fairly low base uh, for of the use of the internet for political uh, purposes. In uh, in recent years, we've had um, conferences, for example, on the role of YouTube, uh, one organized by Stuart Shulman uh, about the 2008 elections, uh, looked at the role of uh, particularly uh, CNN's efforts to use YouTube to uh, encourage people to submit questions uh, during the presidential debates. Uh, and. Uh, we also see quite a lot of research on the use of YouTube for repurposing or reusing uh, campaign ads created primarily for TV broadcasting but then redistributed over the internet. Uh, the general uh, impression of the researchers is so far uh, citizen created content has played a much lower role in elections than uh, campaign created content. Uh, we have some interesting examples of private uh, internet companies uh, putting constraints on the use of their forums for democratic discussion. Uh, AOL, uh, a few years back, limited uh, the use of mailing lists for the sending of mass emails, um, partly because they were concerned about spam, um, the sending of uh, extraneous materials very, via email, um, but that that was uh, loudly protested by the users of AOL, and then uh, AOL, in order to protect children and other other uh, um, other users, uh, were monitoring and censoring certain kinds of materials that were posted to the uh, main website. Uh, also, AOL does not offer a town hall or town meeting forums for members, uh, the way the well, for example, used to do. So the key questions here are what are the philosophical origins of e-democracy? Is geographical community and face-to-face -face interaction essential for democracy? Do virtual communities help or hinder democracy? Why is it so difficult to be an active system? Will the internet help? Uh, do corporate sector discussion forums provide deliberative public spheres uh, the way we would hope they might? Uh, and how useful are the concepts of social capital and public sphere for interpreting the Internet's impact on democratic politics?